Game Banks. I'm so pleased to have Leanne Johnson as my guest today. A uh, little bit of a backstory. So Leanne and I were both from the same country. We, we were talking in the green room earlier. We established we were actually not that far from each other geographically. I, I kept seeing Leanne everywhere. I kept hearing about Leanne everywhere. And I'd never met her. I'm like, this is weird. I, I thought I knew everyone in, in performance marketing, but I'd never met Leanne. And lo and behold, I just happened to be in a bar in Las Vegas when Affiliate Summit was on. And that's where we actually met for the first time. So Leanne, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim, for having me on your mic. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, it was a weird story how we met because I actually found out about you at a Link Unite conference in Florida before I came to Affiliate Summit West. And then lo and behold, I looked across the bar and there you were and that's how we met. So it was fated and meant to be. I'm always amazed at how many uh, people from the UK are prepared to jump on that 10 hour flight to Vegas to go to Affiliate Summit and brutalize themselves for two or three days for work purposes. Yeah. So Leanne, you've been a digital marketer, affiliate marketer for 20 plus years. So what was, what's your backstory? How did you get into digital marketing in the first place? Love that story because yeah. everybody that I've ever spoken to in affiliate marketing has always landed up here by accident and so did I. So about 20 years ago, I was working for an insurance uh, financial services company doing traditional marketing. So print, radio, TV, all, all, all the usual things. And I literally sat there and I thought, if I do another quarterly or annual report, I'm going to want to kill myself because it's just the same all the time, all the time. And at that time in South Africa, in case people want to know what, where this accent's from, online marketing was becoming a bit of a thing. And so there was like one company in the whole of Cape Town that was doing media buying. And I thought, I have to go and check out what this is. And so I checked in my job went and interviewed and they did like a round of six interviews or something ridiculous. And I had to answer every question under the sun, made it through to the last um, interview stage and got the job. And I was like, I can't believe I got the job. I've got no experience in online marketing whatsoever, but I am a good pr uh, marketing practitioner anyway. And they're like, we can teach you all of those things. And I started at the bottom, like right at the bottom. I was a junior account executive with no experience and had to learn the ropes, but I was so in love with online and the fact that I could make decisions and see the impact happening immediately with the customers that were seeing the content that we were creating, um, that I soaked it up like a sponge. And within three months, I was one of the senior media buyers that they had in their team. And from there, it really just spanned on and, and I went into media buying and then I went into performance marketing. Did a little bit of paid contextual marketing, pay-per-click, AdWords, all the usual things that were floating around back in those days. And just absolutely fell in love with affiliate because it combined people, which I love being around people and, and working with people and building relationships. And it, and it combined the numbers, the stats behind what's working, what isn't working. And I found my niche and I thought, this is what I'm meant to do. I woke up every day and I was happy to go into work and I thought, this, this, I found my passion. It was like a, a light bulb moment. And fast forward 20 years later, I'm still in this industry. I'm still having light bulb moments. I'm still loving every day that I, that I work in performance because it combines those two things. It combines people and working with really innovative, clever affiliates who are at the forefront of the internet. And it's also working with brands and, and the data and the analysis that sits behind all the campaigns that we run. So for me, it's some people wake up and they know they want to be a doctor or a lawyer. I woke up and I, I knew I wanted to be in marketing, but I didn't really know what. And then by accident, I found performance and it really just floated my boat. And that's how I got into the industry. I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here. You are by far and away one of the hardest working people in our industry. Like you're everywhere. Again, I, I don't know if that's by design or, or what have you, but no. you're a an award-winning podcaster. We were talking, again, we were talking beforehand about going to the podcast show. We'll talk about that in a second. Mm. But what, what, what I found quite interesting, so you're obviously an award-winning podcaster. And I know from my own experience of doing this pod podcast, how hard that is, how hard it is to create a podcast regularly. Yeah. Again, I've missed a couple of weeks because I've been traveling and so on, yeah. but it's, it's tough. So again, kudos to you thank, for doing that. Thank but you. you're also running Af Af Afi Media, mm. and then you've also got your program management company as well. Yeah. So how do you juggle all those chainsaws? I mean, I I've got really to think of each But I'll be honest with you, it is not by design. It's accidentally on purpose again. And it all starts with having one vision and one focus, and that is to help everybody in the world do affiliate marketing better. So it doesn't matter where you are in your journey. If you are new to affiliate and starting out and you have no idea how to get started, or if you're experienced and seasoned and you want to get to that next level and, and think ahead and be ahead of the trends, 
we've created a flywheel in our business that helps you no matter where you are. And it was, I'd love to say it was by design, but it wasn't. It was due to um, economic factors and, and, and COVID basically. So there's three streams to our business at this point. The first one is we're obviously an, an agency. So we're actually an award-winning agency as well. We manage affiliate programs for brands, for clients. We launch them, scale them, grow them, migrate them, like whatever it is that you need to have done on an affiliate program. We have a very, very experienced account management team that can help you with that. And through the agency, which was the start of our business. So like any other agency owner, you start as a consultant and then you get bigger and you start hiring people and you start bringing on more clients. And then COVID hit. And so it was a timing issue for me because I was like, oh, I've got this agency, but now I can't go to any events. How do I get new business? And so the only way I could do that is, is I pivoted into content marketing. So we launched the podcast to continue that education process. And then we started pushing out a whole bunch of content and inviting, I've got a huge Rolodex of people that have been around a long time people like you even, to start coming in and contributing to that conversation. And we ended up building this community around Appiverse where we've got this media publication now where everybody wants to be in it and advertise on it because we speak to affiliates, affiliate managers, agencies, networks, like people that are practitioners in affiliate marketing. They're coming to listen and learn with us. And so we became an accidental media company overnight, not by design. And obviously during COVID, we wanted to reach our audience in the best way that we could do that was to host virtual events. So we started running these educational events and actually just bringing people together to have conversations about what's changing. Because as you know, in this industry, like things change daily. Like you could be doing something this month and in three months time, that strategy doesn't work anymore. It's been done. So really the keeping ahead of that curve was, was one of the, the things that we wanted to do, which fit back to that vision of helping our customers to do affiliate marketing better. And then the last stream in our business is the fact that we have a 12-week coaching program for affiliate program managers. So it doesn't matter whether you're working agency side, network side, client side, brand side, like you can come and learn with me all the frameworks that I've learned over 25 years. And it sounds it like a long time, but like you have to fail a lot in order to build really successful framework. And we give everybody the edge in terms of thinking about their program differently and coaching them through some of the changes that are happening now around them as well. So it's almost like a supportive program, membership, community, whatever you want to call it, um, to just level up and learn with practitioners that have gone before you. Because as you know, this industry is so fragmented. There's no degree in affiliate marketing. You have to learn everything on the job. And so we just really wanted to invite everybody to come with us to learn how to do affiliate marketing better. And so everything that we've built at Appiverse is really about helping our community to rise up and to really get access to people, practitioners, speakers, whoever it is that I can leverage in my community that I know knows their thing to just come together and learn. And so we've attracted an audience by just putting out good content and making sure that people can get the support that they need in order to do it better because I really love this industry. I've been in it for two decades and I want to see it less in a better place than when I started. And so everything that I'm doing right now is about that next gen of account managers coming into the system who need to be supported and who need to have access to really like knowledgeable people that they wouldn't know that they need access to. Because when you walk into these huge events and we do have big events in our industry, it's a bit daunting. Like, who do you know? Who, who do you follow? Who do you go and talk to? Who, who can you get information from? And so that's kind of what I've, I've got is over the last four years, I've built this business and, and that's what we have is this community of people that want to learn and grow and they just follow and, and, and come along with us. And I'm very proud of that. You, and, and as well, you should be, it's, I think it's what you've achieved is, is like I said, nothing short of amazing, especially as you're also, you have a family, you were just saying beforehand, yeah. you just come back from Spain. I completely appreciate the, the kind of the time it takes to, uh, to kind of run one business, never mind sort that's of what right. effectively <laughs> yeah. has to not not by design. I mean, it just is what it is. So, you know, and I have to just say, Jim, I have an amazing team. Like this isn't just me. Like I've got an amazing team that sits behind me that has helped us to pull this vision forward. And they all believe in what we're doing. Like they all believe that they all come from the industry. So they all know that and they have experienced the lack of knowledge and the lack of support. And they really do want to help the world do affiliate marketing better. And I kind of a strap line. I'm a really simple person. Like I only talk about one subject and that's affiliate marketing, but I love it. I absolutely love it. And hopefully that shines through in everything that we do and all the experiences that we've been able to give to people and, and support them with. So, so one of the, I think one of the challenges with the industry, you said it quite fragmented. It's again, 
I think it's got it's almost got a like a language of its own. Like there's so much jargon. There's so many different names that things are called. So affiliates are also known as publishers. Yeah. Agencies are, are sometimes called program managers. Yeah. There's there's so many different things. Brands are called advertisers, and it's there, there are so many pieces to it. Affiliate marketing, is p- performance marketing, and is it the same thing? And how, how? Why do you think we've never been able to arrive at one set of industry standards to say this is what everything's going to be called from this point forward, and all the other stuff doesn't matter? Affiliate marketing is it's always been affiliate marketing to me. But I think some brands don't want to be associated with affiliate marketing. So it's called performance marketing. And you think well, it's still same the same thing. thing. It's still the same kind of outcome that you're, you're trying to derive. So how do you think we need to address that as an industry? I mean, I think we're in another evolution now. So you and I, in our lifetime in affiliate marketing, will identify with affiliate marketing and know exactly what it means. The next generation came in and said it's performance marketing. So it's pay on performance. Now we're talking about partnerships. Everybody is a partner. And the reason why it's so fragmented is because the internet has changed significantly since affiliate marketing first started, where it was just a website and a single link. Now you've got sub-networks, networks, networks, influencers, different social media channels where you can push content out, email marketers, bloggers, paid media arbitrage sellers. So affiliate marketing is no longer a channel. It's actually a payment method, like if you think about it in in the most basic sense of the word. And so it encompasses everything. And I will go on record and say that the hardest job in digital is to be an account manager in an affiliate program, because you have to have the skills of an SEO, a paid media manager, a, a relationship builder, a influencer or social media manager. You need to understand all the different social platforms and how they work. You need to be able to look outside of web, mobile, and start looking at things like chat and telegram and all of these other places. And so as a practitioner, you're probably one of the most experienced people. And with all of that fragmentation and different terminology that companies adopt internally within their cultural like tone of voice, it has become super fragmented. Like there isn't even a standardized title for an affiliate account manager. Like you can see head of partnerships, head of growth, affiliate account executive, affiliate account manager, affiliate head of affiliate accounting. Like there's so many different words and names and phrases for what you do. It makes LinkedIn very difficult to find people. Like if everybody had the same job title, it would be easy, right? I think it's just, it's the nature of the beast and it's, it's the way that the industry has grown so fast and so fragmented and everybody's just adopted their own colloquialisms. Um, that it's become complex. And what we need to do as an industry is bring it back and go, what is this job? What is this title? What is the kind of function that's associated with that title? Because it does actually also impact career development. If you're starting out as a, as a junior account manager or account exec, what are the the steps to grow forward? And, and what are the sideways moves that you can make after coming in through affiliate as well? Um, and there are many. Yeah. So if you are here and you're listening to this, there are many, many ways that you can grow your career. So if you've got questions about that, you can ask me. Uh, so one of the one of the challenges I've always found with job titles mm. is, is I always used to say to people when when, when I employed uh, people in my original paid search agency, which which morphed into becoming an affiliate network, mm. we had a lot of people that worked for us, and they were like, "Well, what's my job title going to be?" And I'm like, "Well, really, your job title is going to be whatever you want it to be." Right, yeah. your job of ex- expectations will be whatever the job entails. Yeah. Again, it, there's so many kind of components to it. So I think one of the challenges I found when I certainly when I was running my affiliate network is when you're working with affiliates. And I mean, I know you you did a show recently with Harrison and Adam from uh, Ringber. Yeah, yeah off of off of all. Yeah, that was right? fun. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, I, I watched it. I thought this is a wacky interview, but totally. But, but again, I love that. Yeah. That, um, whole That's vibe, vibe that they've got right with the shorts and you see again i don't really think you should be seeing podcasters feet but what the hell yeah gets right works for them um, <laughs> it's funny so so harrison used to be one of our affiliates way way back so again you've, you've everyone's heard the story of we started when he was like really super super young i don't know if he was like 13 14 but he had a black amex card and he was more proud of being a google ads qualified person than he was of having a black Amex and traveling first class and booking himself into hotels, but he was a really good affiliate. But I think one of the challenges when, when you have, uh, affiliate managers working in your 
affiliate network mm. and they see the sort of money that the affiliates are earning, there's this temptation for them to go, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can make 50 grand, 100 grand a month, half a million a month. We had some some crazy payouts to, to affiliates that we were working with. Yeah. How do you keep people kind of focused on the job at hand when they see this kind of shiny object syndrome going on beh behind the scenes, if you like? So I recruit really well. I recruit, and, and this has taken me years to kind of identify the raw traits that make a good affiliate account manager. And let me tell you now, if you think that you can go out there and make millions and, you know, be, be like, Harrison is like, he's 0.001% of the industry. Like, let's just set the record straight. There are some extremely intelligent, successful affiliates out there that know what they know and they've spent years honing their craft. So if you're an affiliate account manager and you're looking on the other side of the fence, believe me, it's not that easy. If it was, I would have done it years ago. Haven't ever been an affiliate, okay, in 25 years. It is damn hard. Um, so really, I think you need to know yourself and you need to know your strengths and you need to know what is your future plan. Like if you're coming into this industry, you need to have goals and you need to have incremental growth and you need to understand where you want to be one day in future. And if you, if you need help with that, you can talk to anybody in the industry. They'll mentor you. You can contact me if you're an affiliate manager and I'll tell you my story. I went from affiliate account manager to CMO to like vice president of business development and marketing, and then left to start my own business and became an entrepreneur. There's so many different ways that you can grow your career and that you can move forward, but know who you are first and know what you're good at. And if you're really, really good at something, stick to what you're good at and build a career around that. And that's what I've done. I'm really good at building relationships with people and I'm really good at explaining complex things in a sim simple manner. And so that I've used those skills in order to grow my career in the areas that I enjoy, because you might look at that shiny picture, go, oh, wow, living the dream. I'm working here, I'm working there, I'm doing everything else. But it is very hard and it is very stressful running your own business. So if, if you think being an entrepreneur is for you, I would say take the leap. But if you think mm, maybe I don't have all the nuts and bolts that make a really successful entrepreneur, then stay on the side that you're on and, and keep developing your career and your skill set. So... I mean, I, I know that the, the, the topic of DEI is on everyone's kind of minds and thoughts and everything. Mm. Again, I, I've, I grew up in Hong Kong, so I've never even thought of diversity as kind of like a, a thing. Yeah. I mean, really, I was the ethnic minority in Hong Kong, right? And clearly that's not the case now. I'm here in the UK. Um, again, I've, I've got um, stepdaughters that work in the industry, mm. have done for, for donkey's years. So again, I've never, ever thought of the whole equality side of things. It's always been, I've always paid as well as I can, mm. right? Um, you know, regardless of whether somebody's like a, a woman or a man, it doesn't matter to me. The, the kind of most important thing is, are they capable of doing the job? Yeah. Um, what do you think we are as an industry? Because I mean, you're, you're a, 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 a staunch fan of uh, Link United, as, as am I, yeah. even though I'm, I'm a man supporting a, a women's initiative, yeah. right? And I'm again, I'm fully supportive of any woman that, that runs a business in addition to obviously a family and everything else. I know how hard it is from, from my perspective to, mm. to kind of like try and be involved in the family. Where do you think we are as an industry in, in that respect? I think uh, we've come now? a long way. Yeah. I think we've come a very long way because back in the day when I was joining the industry, women were few and far between, but it was because this industry was traditionally like a sales, a business development and sales role. And that has traditionally always been a man's kind of domain. So um, 20 odd years ago, I mean, you know, don't know what the average age of your audience is, but like the world was a very different place back then when we, when we first started. So there is still very few female, like senior female CEOs in our industry. I mean, a lot of the big agencies are run by like really successful female CEOs. Um, but I think that we've come a very long way. And I think that the equality is to my mind, what I see, and I can only judge it by the events that I go to and how many people are in the room. It seems to be quite equal compared to other industries. Um, and I'm happy to see that because it is a career that you can have with a family. It is a career that, that you can have flexible working if you find the right companies that offer that. I mean, I, I know of some networks that even work four day work weeks now. Um, so, you know, there's the, the internet allows you to work remotely, to work flexible hours, to be online at different times in the world. And you know, I think that we've leveraged that. So I'm, I'm quite happy with what I'm seeing. 
um, you know, there's always room for improvement, but, you know, I think we've come a long way as, as, a, as an industry and we're very aware of it in our industry compared to others, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, like, like I said, I, th I think the, um, you know, we, we just need to kind of be constantly aware of it. I don't, yeah. I, I, don't, I, I don't think people should just be paying lip service to it. It's something that you should be thinking about all the time, always think in that regard. I mean, again, I mean, you, you, you're an event organizer and I, I'm speaking at your event in September, which yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to do. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that event? Yeah. So um, it's the first time that we're actually going to run an in-person event because we've never done it before. Um, but we get about 2,000 people coming to our virtual events. And the reason why I'm running it in person in London in September is because it's right about the time when people start planning for 2025. So it's really good, good timing. But also we're running it for small, medium advertisers. So, you know, the guys that don't get to go to some of the bigger industry events, they maybe don't have budgets to go to those events, but they also want to learn what's changing. And this year, particularly the theme behind Elevate, obviously the word Elevate is kind of gross, um, but the theme behind it is how do you figure out what's going to happen in 2025 when cookies finally deprecate? Because a lot of these smaller advertisers, these Shopify stores, storefronts, they're all relying on kind of Facebook ads and retargeting. And if they can't retarget on third-party cookies, how are they going to grow their business and where are they going to spend their budget? So we really want to bring people together to understand what the next step is. How do they diversify from all of these channels that have been easy to, to gain access to and to grow their businesses from? And what strategies do they need to be putting in place? And so we're holding it um, in conjunction with Lead Generation World. So um, they're coming uh, from the U.S. to to the, uh, to the UK to support it. Um, and we've got some amazing speakers, I mean, yourself included, but really we've got like some really, like, I don't know if I can say this, but shit hot, like practitioners that know their stuff. Say, you want, yeah. um, and they really are there to come and teach. Like the whole premise of, of everybody that I've asked to come to this event and, and to be there in person on the day is to teach the nuts and bolts of what you need to do to grow your business. So if you're a small advertiser, you're maybe running your business in-house with three to four delegates or, or people, like one of them being a marketer, like get that marketer to this event because one, they're going to get knowledge about what's happening and the changes that are coming in 2025 and where and how to diversify their marketing budgets. They're going to get a chance to speak to industry experts that have been around for, you know, two decades who can help them to navigate the changes that are coming ahead and really just give them the support so that they don't need to be fearful because a lot of people are fearful. How am I going to keep my job? How am I going to keep my business running? Am I going to be able to grow against some of the bigger brands that have got massive budgets and in-house teams? And the answer to all of that is yes, but get yourself organized and get yourself into the room so that you can talk to these people and actually get the advice that you need. So. Again, everything that we do tracks back to helping the world do affiliate marketing better. If you want to do affiliate marketing better next year, come to this conference and actually learn from the people that are contributing their time, their knowledge, their years of experience and helping brands to actually grow. Um, so it's, you know, this, it's not just for advertisers, obviously it's, it's for agencies for, and a, and a lot of agencies are talking to me right now about how do they actually increase their revenue by doing performance. So if you are a paid agency or an SEO agency, and you're thinking about doing performance management for some of your clients as an existing revenue stream, get to this conference because you're going to get to find out the nuts and bolts of what, what you need to know. You might even be able to educate your people as, as you know, post event. And you might come away with some really great ideas of how to monetize your business and actually get extra revenue streams in there. So agencies, networks, brands, publishers, we've got some really great publishers signed up already. They're all coming to learn from the people that we're bringing together. And I'm very, you'll know me. <laughs> I mean, you do know me. I'm very, very like cutthroat about content. Like the content that we put out has to be educational, practical, tactical, and none of the fluff. Like I want to, when I leave this conference, I want to know I have to spend here, here, and here. I need to get this kind of agency in to help me with X, Y, Z. I've got these resource, um, you know, positions that I'm going to need to fill. And I've got a tactical plan about how I can move my business forward. So it's all about the nuts and bolts. Like that's really what we're doing at Innovate this year. I'm really excited to, um, to take myself back on stage at one point in time. I, I spoke at lots of conferences and then I didn't take a, it wasn't a sort of like a forced sabbatical. I just took myself off the stage because I kept saying I was too white, too old and too male. Uh, I just wanted to give more people an opportunity to get on stage. But I realized that there's still there's things that I'm, 
things that I know, things that I'm yeah. doing that have not been talked about because people are not doing the things that I'm doing. And I've, I, again, I don't want to, to kind of eventually get to the point where I stop working and leave the knowledge behind. I'd, I'd like to leave the knowledge so that people can, can continue the industry. Again, I'm, I'm like you, super passionate about ensuring that our industry continues to evolve and grow. It's grown pretty well. When I first started, there was less than a thousand people yeah. in the whole of the UK that probably did digital marketing. Yeah. Right. I think recently, um, I heard that there's over a million people in the UK that are doing digital marketing and far more than that in, in, in Other the rest parts of the world. world right. So it, it's become a huge industry. It's very much in demand. A lot of people are switching from maybe an industry that they've been in for a long time. I mean, I started in financial services okay. um, and I made good money, but I hated the job. Yeah. It was just compliance just drowned me with just dread. I hated every second of that last few years of being in it. And then when I got into the indus this industry, it was so refreshing, new, challenging. It was a, a gold mine, an opportunity. And again, even 25 years later, it's still that. I still think there are massive opportunities because it keeps reinventing itself. Something new will come along again at the moment. I think paper call is a huge opportunity. Oh, it's massive here right. in the UK. I think massive, right? it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit our shores. We're probably like five years behind the US in terms of paper call. But if you think about how we are going to have to capture data and all of the things that are happening with consent, especially here in Europe, Paper call is the next evolution, I think. And in, in actual fact, the next is going to be at, a, at our event, the sponsor of our event. And we need to educate people on how to leverage all of these ways to, put, to find first party data. And the theme of Elevate is where, for, where lead gen and performance will finally collide because we have kept lead generation separate to performance or to affiliate marketing because we thought it was a different channel. And remember, I don't believe that there's a channel anymore. There's no digital channel called affiliate. It's now a payment mechanism. Like if you're paying on CPA or you're paying on revenue share, that is performance. It's paid on performance. And so, you, sh you, you know, paper call is just yet another string to your bow of social, paid, you know, content, all the rest of the stuff that you work with and, all, and partnerships and everything else. And we need to get ahead of that stuff and learn how to leverage it because the times they are changing. And you and I know this and we're comfortable with the changes that are coming because we've been through multiple iterations of it before in our history. But new people coming into the industry don't have access to that history. They don't have access to the times when we had to work through recessions and had to learn new things. They don't have time, access to when um, social media channels launched and everybody was like, what the heck is this? How do we integrate it into our program strategy? What Now you've got huge influencer networks that you're working with and it's like half of the course every day. But we're heading into this new, this next changeover again in 2025 when cookies deprecate. And the way that consumers are searching for products on the internet means that your strategies have to change and the, the channels that you're using might have to change and you might have to implement new technology. And that's what Elevate is all about, is about understanding what is coming and what's changing and learning from people that have gone before you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you talked about uh, influencer marketing. It was really quite interesting because I, I remember way back in probably 2006 or yeah. seven, something like that, like the, the first sort of idea of influencer marketing came out. I think uh, I was working with a company and we got uh, Kim Kardashian at the time because she wasn't that well known as she is now, but we got her to endorse and put out some, some posts about uh, a lip gloss. And mm. again, we paid a ton of money for, for the privilege of, of putting it, the ads out, right? And you couldn't track it 100%. But we reckon that there was probably like a 10x uplift in the, the value of what she delivered in sales, incremental sales, yeah. based on the posts that she put out there. I think the challenge became that there, there was this, you know, influencers were great for a period of time. Now, all of a sudden, the influencers are becoming the brands. They're the ones that they don't, they go, I need to go and work with you and you pay me a commission on whatever. I can just have the brand. You know, if you look at sort of the, the Paul brothers with their their kind of, uh, their energy drinks and there's so many people that have got their own products now so they've almost like cut that piece of the puzzle out of the equation altogether right and I, again i think that's going to continue to evolve and change but that doesn't mean that there isn't still an opportunity to do collaborations with people that fit nicely with the audience that you have for for that purpose for, for the purposes of trying to get their influence to rub off onto to your customer base i mean so. if i look at the way that i've built affervert like everything that we've done has always been about putting the customer at the heart of what we do so 
helping the world do affiliate marketing better. So everything that we do has to help whoever is coming, listening, tuning in, subscribing, whatever it is, has to help them do affiliate marketing better. And if you think about the future, the next evolution of how brands need to be engaging with their consumers and also the next generation, so Gen X, they're not the same as millennials. They use the inter internet differently. Community-based marketing, okay, is going to become one of the most powerful marketing methods that you have. And even to this day, word of mouth marketing is still the best form of advertising, okay? So how do you leverage all of these influences, these content creators, and work with them in a capacity that is unique and individual to them? The one-size-fits-all affiliate program is like long gone. Like anybody that's paying a standard CPA or standard revenue share and expecting every affiliate in the world to conform to that, you are sorely misguided if you think that your program is going to scale because it cannot. So finding tech solutions, finding different ways of collaborating with partners and this industry is still very much built on relationships. Like I can't force you to do something. I have to build a relationship with you and make you trust me. And then you can actually promote my product and look at things. So we have to flip everything on its head. It's not about he who pays the most gets the most affiliates anymore because affiliates are wise to that. They don't want to work with brands that they don't identify with, brands that don't treat them like an extension of their business, brands that treat them like suppliers and just pay them at the end of the month. Like they're too busy for that. They're building a brand themselves. So really thinking about what your future strategy is, and again, reason why we're running Elevate, getting you to the table to actually have these conversations with people that have gone before you and people that can advise you about how things are changing because they know what has happened in the past. And it's almost like being a, like a trader, how to read the market. You know, when things happen, how that impacts and what the leverage is going to be three months down the line, because you've got the past history. And that's the bit that we're trying to share that isn't written down in books. It's not it's not available anywhere online. It's only going to happen at this event because we're creating all the people that need to be there to have this conversation. So it's like a one-time only drill. Like if you don't get there, you're not going to get the information. Um, and I think hopefully it will help people. It'll help people to get over the fear because the fear can be really stopping you from actually innovating and changing and doing new things. But it can also help you to think about what your strategy is for moving forward. Yeah, I, th I think, I, I mean, I, I've always kind of maintained that if you're going to hire somebody to, to help, you should be hiring them for their expertise, not for utility. Just don't hire them as kind yeah. of like a, I just need an agency. I just want you to do all this stuff that I don't want to do. You're hiring somebody for their expertise. Again, if you're running a program, like a program manager like yourselves, it's a case of you, you can bring expertise to the table, a different view in terms of how you can acquire new sales mm. for their business that may be outside of the kind of current scope of what they're doing as a business. And again, you, if you work with people that are email marketers or uh, PPC specialists or SEO specialists or chatbot specialists, I mean, there's so many different ways people can drive traffic incrementally to your brand to help boost your sales. And some of those will be things that would be far more uh, difficult and expensive for you to try and implement on your own. Mm. It's much better to kind of part with somebody who is an expert in that particular discipline and actually get them to be the person that delivers that piece from it. So it's not cannibalizing anything that you've got going on at the moment. So again, I think it's usually there's the silos within the business. There's usually a somebody that, that maybe runs their current PPC is threatened by the thought of other PPC people coming in to run traffic to, for that particular program. And I, I've always maintained, if you're a brand, I'd rather have me and seven of my affiliates promoting my product than Google choosing, you know, me and seven of my competitors, because they're not going to just leave the ad spaces blank. They're going to fill them up with other stuff. And I would much rather the spaces were filled with my products and my affiliates rather than somebody else's mm. and, and any brands that kind of like run a program that, that, that do that. I mean, that's where that consultation with a program manager like Leanne can actually explain why that's a beneficial strategy to employ. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, time for money and time for expertise, like the two very different things. Like we, we work with some clients where we just give them the insights. We take a fresh look and I can't express the value and a fresh set of eyes can have on looking over your program. And it's not, it's simply because as marketers, we get into blinker mode. We do things that always work. We want to continue the iteration of everything that we're doing. 
And sometimes getting an outside perspective in can really open up your eyes to thinking about things differently. And that's another reason why I always tell people, get out to every single event that you can get to, whether it's online, virtual, in-person, whatever. Like if your budget can afford you to get to every single event, get to them because it's not only the speakers that you're going to be learning from, it's your industry peers as well. Like everybody yeah. is going through the same journey you are. They all have different perspectives of the entire marketplace that we're working in and leverage all of those conversations to learn. Yeah, as, mu as much as you can learn from online education, mm. you gain so much more by actually being in person at an event. Um, and again, I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're getting back to some sort of normality. Me too. Uh, funny enough, talking about that, um, I, again, Leanne were talk and I were talking beforehand, um, we both went to the podcast show that <laughs> didn't actually meet. Had we known that we were going to be there, I'm pretty sure we could have met up yeah. and had a drink and yeah. have maybe a grab, grabbed a bite to eat or something. Yeah. But uh, I, and I, I was curious. I mean, I had my own thoughts about that particular show. I was curious to know what your thoughts were uh, as a more well-established podcast. I mean, my podcast is pretty new, but yours is far more established. Well, what did you think? First of all, I didn't know that I had an established podcast because I just assumed that we were ticking along, tickety-boo, like really nice, um, nice little community that we've got there and some interesting people that come on. But it turns out that we actually have something pretty big. So the numbers in podcasting are way different to the numbers that you'd expect in like web. Okay. So, you know, if you've, if you've got, like we have a quarter of a million people downloading our podcast which i thought was tiny if you think about joe rogan and stephen bartlett and all of these big huge podcasters but apparently we're, we're quite big um and that's great because it means that we're reaching lots of people and we're giving valuable information again everything that we do is centered around the customer that that we're trying to talk to um but it's not something that you the podcast isn't something that you make money from it's something that you use to actually leverage and grow your brand and, and build your audience around you around what it is that you're trying to do so for me, it was interesting. There was a lot of AI, a lot of tech there, which was also quite interesting. Um, but a lot of people that also didn't really know what they were talking about. So it um, seems to be it's an industry that's fashionable because there was a lot of people there, but everybody, but fragmented. So very similar to how uh, affiliate marketing is. And everybody's still trying to find their feet. One thing I can say, though, is that um, it's quite easy to build your podcast listenership and ad revenues, because I was I was talking to some of the ad networks that were there, um, the the value for money that you get off of podcasting and advertising on podcasts is phenomenal because the retention rate of people listening to what you're selling instead of visually, we're so like sight blind now because we've been bombarded for years with visual stuff that audio actually has a much higher like ROI rate, so. Yeah, if you want to get your business seen and heard and you want to get in front of practitioners that can use your tools, get yourself into podcasts and, and advertise and sponsor them because it's very good value for money compared to other digital channels. And it's evergreen. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and I thought it was quite interesting that, that sort of I think a lot of the events were sponsored by YouTube. Yes. Right. And again, I, I, I sat on, on some of the panels where people were talking about YouTube coming into podcasting. They're replacing say replacing their using YouTube music as being their sort of podcast platform of choice. Mm. Um, and I, I think there, there was somebody from uh, YouTube there and they came up with a really great um, terminology. I think it was eyes optional. So mm. in other words, create a video, right? But it's got to stand on its own as an audio only. So again, don't say, and what I'm showing you on here is this. And what I'm showing you on here is that because that won't fly if somebody's just listening to the audio. So it's got to be, the video will enhance it, make it a better experience for those people that watch video, right? And it's it's quite interesting. I think that there was some stats that came out that basically said that Gen Z, about 40% of them prefer to watch videos rather than listen to videos. Mm. And I think it was something like 50% of, of people watch a podcast episode on a TV. So again, you, wow, so it's got to be, it's almost like you've got to think, well, maybe in that case, instead of me just shooting on a, a phone or something like that, maybe I need to kind of invest in higher quality or audio and video because then that way, if somebody is watching it on a 85 inch TV, you don't really want it to be like a 360 P kind of grainy mm. experience because that's not really going to fly. Again, I think that's probably where you look at the 
Joe Rogan's and Stephen Bartler's, they, they've kind of obviously gone. Well, they've got their own studios. Know, heavy, yeah, they, I mean. The... Heavy, yeah, they've gone studios, but they've also gone heavy on, on kind of video as well yes. because it helps to, yeah. to kind of really sort of put that that sort of a different feel on it. I think uh, I, th I think Stephen Bartlett's um, editor was talking about they've gone from, uh, I think, a million subscribers on YouTube. They've now got six million on YouTube. Yeah. Every, yeah. Virtually every episode that he puts out is a podcast. So it's almost like his his entire presence on YouTube has become podcast related. So you mentioned about not making money. I'm pretty sure he's probably not covering the overheads of the number of people he's got running the business, but I'm pretty sure he's making decent money on the back of the, the, the stuff that he's doing. And again, a lot of the advertising mm. for his podcast is actually embedded in the content. So it's almost like become the content is in the podcast rather than it being the pre-roll, mid-roll, post-roll. It's actually in, it embedded in there. And again, I think the kind of the, there was a, a lot of conversations on at the podcast show about whether host red is the best format for the ads to appear in, in the, the sponsorships to appear in, in podcasts. And again, I think a lot of it is if you have a podcast host, they know their audience. So they know what the ads should be like, and they shouldn't prostitute themselves by selling their soul, by having sponsors on that aren't going to be a good fit for that particular audience, because it'll switch the audience off pretty quickly and they'll just bail off and go somewhere else. Yeah. And yeah. consistency, consistency, like that's the one thing that really found has worked for us is consistency, consistency on the format, consistency on what you get when you listen to it. So tactical, practical advice, like everything that we've done has always been about, like, if I'm going to have a conversation and, and we're vertical agnostic, like as a business, we're vertical agnostic because affiliate marketing is like shoes. You can wear trainers, you can wear high heels, you can wear flip-flops, you can, but it still fits on your foot basically. So, so we don't like focus on any vertical, but even the verticals, and we've got like a 50-50 split of, you know, iGaming and non-iGaming, non everything else. Um, but even the iGaming episodes get as much downloads as the non-iGaming episodes because every single episode is always about learning something new, whether it's in your vertical or not. And so the perspectives of people that we interview is what's actually become interesting on our podcast. And I suppose because the podcast is hosted by a practitioner, so I'm not just like a host. I'm not a content creator. I'm actually a practitioner. I know what questions to ask. Um, I suppose that's what makes it more interesting. So yeah, I think it's quantity over quant quantity, basically, because we only do one podcast a week, like every week we have a podcast. Um, and it's always somebody that I've either found or has contacted me that I think is interesting. And it's even people that are like totally off the radar that have never been to an affiliate event, but have like 25 million followers. Like we did an amazing interview with Sharon Rector. Um, from First Media and she, her PR company actually contacted us and, and said, you know, she'd like, love to get on your podcast. And I was like, well, who is she? I've never met this woman 25 years in to the industry. And she's just super phenomenal. So if you haven't listened to that podcast, sorry to listen to gems and then go and listen to that one because it was super interesting. Again, I, that's one thing that came across to me loud and clear at the podcast show mm -hmm. is it's, a, it's the collaboration. It's being a guest on other people's podcasts and you were very kind to invite me to be a guest on yours. Um, and again, for me, it was a no brainer to kind of have you as a guest on mine. Thank you. Um, you know, and yeah, I mean, like for me, I, I, I've become a big podcast fan on the back of creating a podcast. And I, again, I've got so much more admiration for the people that, that make good podcasts, right? Cause I know how hard it's been for me to try and get to that point. Right. Yeah. And, but know, keep I, doing I, it. I, Perseverance pays off. <laughs> absolutely. That's, that's always been the, the kind of the mantra. I mean, my 25 years in digital marketing, I mean, when I first started buying traffic in a particular vertical or particular offer, right, sometimes I might lose a ton of money to begin with, but I'd eventually work out how to make it work yeah. and recoup the losses and then make good, good profit. But equally, I think you can't rest on your laurels. You can't expect it to just be like that forever. There's usually a w limited window of opportunity. You've got to try and capitalize on it and then learn from it and try and make sure that when it does eventually start going south, that you're ready to pivot on to, to try so either try some, some alternative method of traffic generation or whatever it might be. Don't just sit there and, and let it just wilt on the vine. It'll just, it'll die eventually because that's just the natural evolution of things. I love that piece of advice for affiliate programs too. Like if you take exactly that clip and apply it to your affiliate program, you'll probably uh, inject some new life into it over the next couple of weeks. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is. It's just literally con constantly keeping an eye on what's working, 
great if it's working, but constantly looking for the next thing that's going to come to either complement that or replace it if, if the kind of the original idea kind of goes by the wayside. I, I did some gambling uh, offers way back in the day. I woke up one day to find that Google had basically said, we're not taking gambling ads anymore. And I'm like, fuck, what the hell do I do now? I've got like a whole site that was generating a ton of money. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what do I do now? So basically I created a website because I was running, I think it was like Bingo and Tombola. Right. And, and I'd done some kind of audience analysis and it was primarily housewives sitting at home and with small children, children had gone to bed and they'd have a game of Tombola because it was good for them. They would go on and, and just play. And I was getting paid decent money for each new player I got signed up. I'm like, what do I do now? So I created a recipe site and all the ads on there were for basically Tombola and Bingo. So I had banner ads all over the place, not so outlandish that it, it became crazy. Like you've got in, on some of the sites now. Oh, you see some of these <laughs> yeah, horrible, <laughs> horrendous. But it, but it was certainly enough to give me decent numbers of impressions that I could then potentially try and monetize. And my keywords that I was buying, instead of buying tombola, bingo, stuff like that, I was buying like ham and cheese sandwich recipe <laughs> or banana, avocado, yeah. onion. People would type in onion. It's it, it, for me, and obviously the cost of that traffic was like pennies to the pound. Right? Yeah. But and I had to. Con I think I worked it out. I had to convert something like one in six thousand clicks into a paying customer to break even on my sort of. You know, I think it was like two hundred dollars. I was getting paid for a new new player. I was buying traffic four or five cents. Literally, I just had to convert one in five thousand, six thousand people to to make profit. And then eventually, Google said. We'll take, we'll take money for, um, for ads again, uh, for gambling. And I'm like, okay, great. I don't need to have the recipe site back to it, but it's, you but know, that's if, pivot. Yeah, I, just, I mean, that's pivot that needs to happen. I could, have just it. I could have just left it and said, well, I'm not going to do gambling anymore, but there's always a way, there's always a way around a solution. And that's where, again, I think a good program manager can help find those solutions mm. to problems that, you know, everyone else is struggling with. Right. But there's always a solution. There's always a way to kind of get around it. Totally. Cool. Anyway, Leanne, we, we, like I said, we could talk forever and I'm sure when we, when we uh, see, see each other in September, we will talk forever. Mm -hmm. All right. Again, I'm so excited right. to come to the show. Thank you. All of Leanne's, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, all of Leanne's contact details and uh, information is available in the show notes, uh, which will be available when we post the episode. Only remains for me to say you've been a fantastic guest. I've loved having you on the show and uh, look forward to seeing you at some point in time soon. Thank you so much for having me on, Joe. It's really nice to be on the other side of the mic for a change. And you know what? I mean, my, my podcast is called Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. I think this is one of the best decisions I've made having you on as a guest. It's been, been phenomenal. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.